So it's great pleasure to have Professor Robert Mann from uh, the Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of Waterloo in our QASTM forum. He's going to give the 53rd talk in this series. Professor Mann is quite expert in this area, but uh, for the other people, those who don't know him, for them, it's a small introduction. His expertise area is gravitation, quantum physics, and the overlap between these two. Also, he's very much interested in the testing uh, uh, this kind of physics in presence of quantum information theory through experiments. Uh, Professor Mann uh, did his uh, PhD from uh, University of Toronto very long time ago. So he's quite senior and he got a lot of prestigious um, uh, prizes and uh, he's associated with a lot of uh, uh, professional uh, association. I am not going to that. Today's topic of discussion, which he is going to present to all of us, is the connection between physics and chemistry in terms of black hole. So he will talk about a very interesting topic, which is black hole chemistry. And I am hopeful everybody will learn a lot from this. And uh, thank you, Professor Mann, for uh, giving this uh, 53rd QASTM Zoominar uh, lecture and we are very happy to have you in this forum and we are all welcoming you uh, from at our site so you can start okay well thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction um, this is a subject that I've been working on for the last uh, eight years some odd and uh, it's called black hole chemistry and this is a uh, I guess a drawing of me in my lab with one of my grad students going out to uh, collect things or else escape. Um, it's actually a very, what I think has become a rather interesting adventure in black hole thermodynamics. And as the title might have suggested to you, what we've discovered in this is that black holes have properties that might be better appreciated or described as being chemical in nature. There is, uh, there are two uh, review articles I can point you to on this. One is a topical review here a couple of years ago in, well, four years ago now, I guess, in classical and quantum gravity. And another is a short monograph book I wrote on the subject as well that has overlap with the black hole information problem but there have been developments in the last four years, and I hope to get to some of them in this talk. I do have quite a number of slides. I don't know if we'll get to them all, but we'll just see how it goes. So uh, what is a black hole? Probably most people that listen to this know, but when I teach undergrads, I like to start with this question. How fast does a rocket have to be launched to fully escape Earth's gravity? And the answer is well known. It's easily figured out to be 11.2 kilometers per second from Newtonian physics if you neglect uh, atmospheric effects and other energy losses. And one can do this for other planets in the solar system and other stars, and the denser they are, the larger the escape speed. So for example, uh, Jupiter's escape velocity is 59 and a half kilometers per second. Uh, Neptune's is 23 and a half. The sun is 50 time, 55 times larger than that of the Earth. So about 240 years ago, a guy named John Michel asked the question, what would a star look like if its escape speed was faster than light could travel? And of course, it was a theoretical speculation at the time, but he reasoned, well, it would have to be dark because if the escape velocity was greater than light, light couldn't shine 
from this star because it simply would not be able to escape the star's gravitational pull. At that time, it was thought by many that light was particulate in nature and would feel gravity, though there was a debate then. Uh, so here is a quote from John Michel's paper on this subject that really, I think one could say this is the first paper on black holes, though he called them dark stars. And he said, if the semi-diameter of a sphere of the same density with the sun were to exceed that of the sun in the proportion 500 to one, a body falling from infinite height toward it would have acquired at its surface a greater velocity than that of light. And consequently, supposing light to be attracted by the same force in proportion to its vis inertiae with other bodies, all light emitted from such a body would be made to return toward it by its own proper gravity. In other words, a body 500 times the density of the sun would have an escape velocity greater than light. Well, this idea was put to rest for over 200 years uh, because, I guess, well, no, 125 years, I guess, uh, because uh, Laplace came along and suggested, based on other experiments, that light was actually a wave. And so it wasn't clear that it responded to gravity by the same force in proportion to its vis inertiae. But today we know light and all forms of energy do feel gravity. The theory that describes it is general relativity. And one of the main features that came out of general relativity was that there could be such objects, dark stars, regions of space for which the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. That was the version in 1783. Today, we call these things black holes, a name that was coined in the late 1960s by John Wheeler, uh, to be objects whose boundary is a trapped surface, which means that if you are within the trapped surface and a light ray shines, the uh, outgoing light rays and have uh, negative expansion just as the ingoing light rays do. Normally, if you have something like a firecracker or, a, or an explosion, the light moves outward and it has positive outward expansion. But in a trapped surface, it would have negative outward expansion. In other words, it would contract due to the gravitational pull within the trapped surface. And because nothing travels faster than light, once you go beyond this surface, you've ta you're taking a one-way trip as this person here is trying to dive into this black hole. Well, I could go on a lot about the history of these objects, but I wanna get to the main event. What I think is most remarkable in my lifetime and in all of yours is that these objects actually exist. And here I've reproduced data from the papers of the two people that won this year's Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, Gez and Genzel, uh, who found the first indication that uh, an object at the center of the Milky Way is actually a very massive black hole. And we call this object Sagittarius A star. Well, we have also, just last year, seen the first picture of a black hole from the event horizon telescopes. Rather, we see the shadow of the black hole. And uh, this picture uh, won the breakthrough prize, or rather the group won the breakthrough prize in physics of tw uh, uh, just uh, recently, I guess of 2020. And most dramatically, perhaps, we have seen LIGO come online just a few years ago and detect the first gravitational waves. And now we have quite a number of events. Here I'm showing uh, the most recent announcement, which is that of a binary black hole merger in which two stars formed a black hole of total mass 150 times that of the sun. I remember being, uh, uh, when I was a student, being told by professors they were very skeptical these objects actually existed. I remember an astronomy professor telling me when 
uh, Caltech said there's probably a black hole at the core of M87. He said Caltech has a good press office. But I think today we have the strongest evidence that these objects actually exist. There is still, uh, curiously enough, ongoing scientific research to be as sure as we can be that these things really are black holes. But the circumstantial evidence today has never been so good. I think this is uh, one of the most remarkable scientific developments in my lifetime, if not of all of history. Why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because if they do exist, physics really is very strange because these objects, according to the theory of general relativity, have a singularity at their core where time and space no longer exist. General relativity predicts that geodesics will be incomplete inside a black hole. And the more dramatic way of saying that is that the gravity is so powerful that literally a hole has been ripped into space and time. Time and space don't exist and therefore the laws of physics don't exist because you can't have physics without space and time. They're also inevitable as Hawking and Penrose showed uh, as a result of gravitational collapse. They cannot be stopped as long as energy is positive. Gravity always wins every competition if you let enough mass collect together. That uh, feature also won Penrose this year's Nobel, a share of this year's Nobel Prize. They can be mined for energy if they are, for example, spinning around. You could glance an object off a black hole, not so it plunges in, but so it glances off and it can extract energy up to a certain extent. We now know from LIGO that they collide and produce gravity waves. Uh, they behave as thermodynamic objects, which is the subject of this morning's discussion. They also can be produced primordially, for example, pairwise in the early universe, and they are the source of paradoxes in quantum physics, quantum information paradoxes. I won't say a whole lot about that today, but the thermodynamic behavior of these things is connected with that. How do we get a black hole? Well, here is a diagram where radial distance is horizontal and time is upward. And without any black holes, light cones just point straight up, which means if you're right at this point at the, at the apex of this cone, your future is contained uh, within the extension of this cone and the same over here. Now, suppose we have a collection of collapsing matter. Well, that matter will get smaller and smaller and the light cones on the edge of this matter will begin to tilt inward due to the gravitational pull. As you can see, if nothing stops this process, then eventually they will meet at this point right here. And when that happens, a singularity will form. And as Hawking and Penrose shows, this is a generic property. It is not unusual. It is normal within the context of general relativity. And prior to this, a trapped surface forms, which means that any observer, any piece of matter, anything that falls within this black region will never escape. Their light rays will be pulled inward and collide with this singularity symbolized by this jagged line. This boundary is what we call the event horizon though more properly at any finite time, it should be called the apparent horizon. Uh, blue light escaping the star will be redshifted and the closer and closer one gets to the trapped surface, the greater the redshift until it becomes infinite when these lines cross. And there are some nice uh, qualitative discussions of this process in this, in this paper here uh, by Matt Visser and collaborators. All right, so let's, before we get into the black hole chemistry, let's take a brief look at the basic features of black holes. 
Um, I was told I could be technical in this talk, so I'm certainly going to be. Uh, Einstein's equations are the foundation of general relativity. And they say that uh, space and time are curved due to the stress energy of matter. So TAB is a four by four uh, tensor, uh, uh, two index right for tensor that encapsulates or that describes whatever we believe the matter content to be uh, in the area, whether it's uh, uh, a perfect fluid, whether it's um, electromagnetic fields or whatever it is that you like, scalar fields. And the right hand side is a term linear in the Riemann curvature tensor. It's a particular linear combination of contractions of the curvature tensor. We call it the Einstein tensor. And I think a straightforward way to think about this is if you tell me what the right-hand side is, I can solve for the left-hand side to get this quantity little g called the metric because big G is a rank four two index tensor that is a basically a set of differential equations of the component of the metric. Once the metric is known, we then know the gravitational field of the space time that is generated by this stress energy. And in principle, we know anything about the space time. Now, if we solve these under the following constraints, namely axial symmetry and the electro vacuum, in other words, we imagine that perhaps there is some going to be some charge located at the center and it generates an electromagnetic field. Then we obtain this metric here, which is called the Kerr-Newman metric. And I'm putting this down deliberately because I'm going to be using it a few times at various places in the talk. Um, it's a bit of a complicated metric. I'll discuss its features momentarily. Um, we also have the gauge potential A here whose curl gives the electromagnetic field F, the electric and magnetic fields of the space time generated due to this charge Q, which can be thought of as residing inside uh, the collapsing matter after it has collapsed. So you can see the metric depends on a parameter A, a parameter M, and this charge parameter Q, and it has a somewhat complicated structure. Uh, we call it the Kerr-Newman metric. It was found in the late 1960s uh, by Ted Newman and collaborators working on the uh, original rotating solution that Roy Kerr found in 1963. So here it is again, and it has special cases, the best known of which is when Q and A are both zero. That means big A vanishes, this term vanishes, that term vanishes, uh, sigma is just R squared, delta is just R squared minus 2M. And if you uh, uh, put, this, uh, put this in there, you obtain this simple metric known as the Schwarzschild metric, uh, which is the most familiar metric to anybody that does general relativity. If we set A to zero, but keep Q non-zero, then we have what is called the Reissner-Nordstrom solution. And what we can see here is the presence of charge modifies the original metric function. And I probably should have said, far away from this object, when R is very large, this term goes to zero, and we have the metric of flat space. In other words, that's another way of saying far from an object, gravity is weak. When R equals 2M, we have the event horizon of the space time. The presence of charge modifies the structure of the horizon in this way, but you can see that the contribution due to charge is opposite to that of mass, but also weaker at large distance. If we have Q zero, but A non zero, we obtain the solution originally found by Kerr. And it looks like this. It corresponds to a black hole that is rotating about uh, an axis 
uh, uh, about the z-axis in the space-time. So these are the three most famous metrics uh, that appear in general relativity. And I expect these are familiar to most people in the audience here. Uh, I'm going to make use of these at various places in the talk. Now, what are the basic properties of the Kerr-Newman black hole? Well, they have two conserved quantities associated with the uh, gravitational properties itself, namely the mass and the angular momentum. And these can be calculated by well-known means. I, I'm not gonna show the slide that shows you how to do that, but you can get it from a definition of the Komar mass or perhaps uh, use a quasi-local definition of mass. Uh, but these objects, capital M, uh, these quantities, capital M and capital J, can be shown to be uh, conserved. And they are well-defined features of the space-time associated with these killing vectors, d by dt and d by d phi of this metric. There is also a conserved asymptotic electric charge that turns out to be equal to little q in the units that I'm using here. And then there are other uh, features of this space-time. As I said, it, it corresponds to a black hole, so its event horizons are located where delta, this quantity delta here, vanishes, where this part of the metric diverges and this component will go to zero. And one can show that, uh, uh, one way of understanding it is you can compute where this quant, you can compute the norm of this quantity and where that norm is zero, this thing vanishes. And you find that that will happen when the radius is equal to m plus or minus the square rooted quantity. Uh, it's when q and a are zero, it's equal to 2m or zero. When q and a are not zero, we have an outer horizon, which is the plus sign and an inner horizon given by the minus sign. The surface gravity of the black hole is defined by the uh, by the gradient of the killing vector projected along its own direction, and that turns out to be proportional to itself times a number kappa, which is given by this quantity here when you work out this equation. It's r plus minus m over m times r plus. And it is basically uh, analogous to the surface gravity of the Earth. And for a uh, large object where the gravity is weak, you can show that it in fact reduces to that. That's how we get the little g of mg. And it also has a surface area uh, given by 4 pi. Uh, if you fix little t and little r uh, at the horizon, then you can compute the area of the two surface and it works out to be that, and that is the surface area of the black hole. And all of these quantities are gonna become important in what I have to say later, which is why I uh, am presenting them here. One of the key features you can prove from general relativity is that this quantity never gets smaller. It only ever can get larger, provided energy is positive. So let's get to the thermodynamic aspects of black holes. In the early 1970s, I think 1972, uh, John Wheeler, who was a prof at Princeton at the time, had a group ha would meet regularly with his grad students, and they would have discussions about gravity. And he asked this question at one of the sessions. What happens if you pour a cup of tea? He liked to have tea during the meetings, as I do right here. What happens if you pour a cup of tea into a black hole? Well, you might think, I don't know, nothing. Why does this matter? But if you think about it, the T is hot. It has entropy. But the black hole is a trapped surface or has a trapped surface around it. It absorbs everything and it is structureless. So it must have zero temperature because if it didn't, it would be emitting particles. But the T is hot. 
So it looks like you violated the second law of thermodynamics. There was entropy in the hot tea, but there can't be any entropy inside the black hole or it would have heat. Where does the entropy go? Well, one of the students in the group thought this was an interesting question. Jacob Beckenstein was his name. And he, after a fair amount of thinking, thought this. Well, the T has mass as well as heat, as well as entropy. So this mass will make the mass of the black hole a little bigger. And so its area must increase. So whenever you throw anything into a black hole that has some heat, the black hole will get bigger. So we had this idea that maybe area is a kind of entropy that the manifestation of disorder in everyday matter becomes equivalent somehow to the area of the black hole. And just the way that area can never decrease, entropy can never decrease. Well, the problem with this idea is there was no analog of, of temperature. And it uh, turned out that Stephen Hawking who I understand was originally skeptical of Beckenstein's idea, actually showed that once you take quantum effects into account, black holes will radiate away particles just the way a black body does. And it's their temperature is equal to the surface gravity of the black hole over two pi. And the entropy is given by a quarter of the area which means Beckenstein was right up to a factor of four. I have suppressed factors of H bar C and G here. Um, they will appear, H bar uh, will appear in the numerator and C squared will appear here. So if H bar were zero, there would be no temperature of the black hole. Now this at the time was very controversial and in the late 70s, when I became a grad student, it was still somewhat controversial, but it has since been demonstrated in many ways using a number of different mathematical approaches, uh, uh, using the original quantum field theoretic Bogliubov methods that Hawking did. Uh, a simpler demonstration using Euclidean path integrals was given by Hawking and Hartle a few years later. Um, about 20 years ago, it was shown how to more directly calculate this from quantum tunneling. And there are a couple of other methods having to do with anomalous breaking of diffeomorphism symmetry and requiring the quantum state of the exterior to solve the semi-classical Einstein equations. The point I'm trying to make here is this is now a very robust mathematical calculation if our understanding of quantum field theory is correct, if our understanding of general relativity is correct, and if a semi-classical combination of those, namely it is meaningful to combine quantum physics with classical gravity is also correct. So let me say a little bit about this tunneling approach. Uh, Parikh and Wilczek came up with it and there were a couple of papers afterward uh, that showed, one of them with me and my student, uh, Ryan Kerner, uh, uh, to show how to apply this to a very general class of black holes. So if you think of quantum physics, if an electron hits an electric field, that's a barrier. The field can repel the electron. And classically, the electron would move up, slow down, and then bounce back. But in the quantum picture, it is a wave. And so, Whereas it bounces back in the classical picture, in the quantum picture, while it may bounce back sometimes, it will also, it also has the possibility of tunneling through the barrier, depending on the barrier's height and thickness. And this phenomenon is, is very well known and it forms the basis for many devices like transistors that make the computer I'm using possible. Well, what about a black hole? Well, in the case of a black hole, quantum field theory says that in empty space, there are virtual particle-antiparticle -particle pairs being created and destroyed all the time. That's the nature of the quantum vacuum. 
and the, the, the existence of this quantum vacuum gives rise to um, what we call loop effects in particle physics that are now well known and have been studied in collider labs. If a black hole is present, every now and then a pair might be created but destroyed inside the hole. But what can happen is that sometimes a pair is created and only one falls into the hole. The other doesn't and escapes to infinity. Well, the only way this could possibly happen is since we started with zero energy here, if this particle gets to infinity and has positive energy, the only way that can happen is if this one took negative energy into the black hole and made the black hole's mass a little bit smaller. And so the black hole can lose energy via this process. And this is what Hawking demonstrated with Bogliubov transformations. Uh, although the tunneling picture was conceived of back in the 70s, it wasn't actually demonstrated until this paper here by Parikh and Wilczek, and then a few years later showing that this can work for pretty much any kind of black hole. So a black hole is basically a hot particle radiator. So let me say a little bit about gravity and thermodynamics. How do we put these things together? If a black hole is hot, it means that thermodynamics and gravity must have something to do with each other. But this is not as straightforward as you might think. In our everyday life, we know the weather gets hot and cold and the Earth has a gravitational field. So in some sense, you might think it's not a big deal. But of course, we don't ever really think in everyday life about how the gravitational field of the Earth changes the temperature. Why is this a bit strange? Well, gravity is always attractive. It's a long range force. So unlike the molecular forces that are generally repulsive between molecules, gravity will tend to clump systems together instead of spreading them out. The non-gravitational forces between molecules tend to get them to bounce off each other, but, if, but gravity will tend to make them stick together. And there has been study on this subject, not hugely intensely, but somewhat since the early 1970s. And it is not known even to today if a one-dimensional um, self-gravitating system, in other words, a system of particles in one dimensions that only attract each other gravitationally, it's not known if this system will approach equilibrium under general initial conditions or not. Um, the greatest application of this kind of thing is in galaxy formation, and that's a very intense level of study today, but that's not my interest here. Let's look at an example. Suppose I have a spherical box of radiation. I've got a box and inside is radiation. The box has radius R. Now let's say R is much larger than 2GM over C squared, which would be the event horizon of the object if it were a black hole. But it's much bigger than that. It's just a big box. Well, it will have a mass, it, it, the, the radiation sorry, we'll have an energy density rho that's given by the Stefan-Boltzmann law, sigma t to the fourth, and its entropy is given by uh, the volume, four-thirds the volume of the box over three times its, uh, uh, times its density. Now, if the radius, as the radius gets smaller and smaller, these features become less and less correct. And once you are less than 5 gm over c squared, still not a black hole, but not far from it, the sphere becomes increasingly inhomogeneous and gravity begins to have an effect. It will get hotter at the center. Its mass will no longer equal uh, the integral of the density over the sphere's volume. And it's no longer extensive. You can't scale the radius and the mass to get the same sphere. Its heat capacity will decline to zero. Okay, 
that does show that gravity can have an effect on temperature and entropy if it's heavy enough without even being a black, without there even being a black hole present. Can we put objects in contact thermally due to gravity alone? And the answer is yes, due to this little argument. Suppose I have two of these spheres of masses one, M1 and M2, T1 and T2 temperature, R1 and R2 radius. Suppose I have a bucket. I can lower the bucket just near the first one and open the bottom of it and let in a little radiation and then lift the bucket away from the black from the from the object it's not a black hole it will cost me work to do this and the amount of work is 1 minus alpha 1 times the mass this should be big m1 of the object then i'm going to move the bucket over here at no cost, because I'm equally far away from each object, and then I'm going to compress the bucket a little bit. Well, to compress the bucket takes more work. It's the pressure volume law. I'm squeezing the radiation, and you can calculate the amount of work to be this much. Then I'm going to lower this bucket to the surface of the other object. That will gain me some energy, work will be done on me by this amount here, where alpha two is the redshift factor, if you like, due to the second object. Alpha one is the redshift due to the first object. And so the total work, I do work here, I do work here, and I gain work here. The total amount, when you add these three things together, is alpha m1, alpha times the uh, mass times the ratio of the temperatures if I took M to be equal there. Or if I wanted to, I could change the final step so the bucket doesn't quite set, get so close and I can basically balance off W3 with W1 and W2. And so I could transfer heat from one bucket to the other or from one, sorry, from one box to the other without doing any work. So the point of this object, of this exercise, is that I can do heat transfer. And these previous arguments are there to show that gravity itself has a thermodynamic character, whether we have black holes or not. The idea of black hole thermodynamics is that black holes are thermodynamic systems in their own right that have many properties familiar to regular thermodynamics. Stationary black holes are equilibrium states. Other kinds of black holes can be regarded as non-equilibrium states. The conserved quantities, M, Q, and J, and perhaps others, depending on the black hole, are preserved in the process. This is guaranteed by no hair theorems in general relativity, though people have found ways around them these days. In higher dimensions, black holes can have more than one kind of electric charge and more than one kind of angular uh, momentum. So, so okay. what is black hole? Question? Yes, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, in the previous slide, when you talked about the uh, uh, non-equilibrium states, can, can you uh, elaborate this thing a little bit more? Okay, one example would be a Viega solution which has a black hole uh, horizon that is increasing with time. So the surface gravity would not be constant. And so that's like a system that is not at constant temperature. So it's not an equilibrium. Okay. okay. And you could imagine others, when black holes collide, they won't be in thermodynamic equilibrium. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that okay? Yes. Okay. So what is black hole chemistry? Well, in the early 1970s, Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking, just before Hawking discovered temperature, uh, constructed a geometric argument that became the four laws of black hole mechanics that we now call the four laws of black hole thermodynamics. The zeroth law is related to the question we just had, namely that for a stationary black hole, the surface gravity is constant over the event horizon. The first law is that differences in mass between nearby solutions are equal to differences in area times the surface gravity plus additional work terms. Uh, 
here I've got omega dj and phi dq. Phi is the electromagnetic potential. dq is the change in charge. Omega is the angular velocity at the horizon. And dj is a change in angular momentum. So that's the first law is change in energy is heat plus work. The second law is what Bekenstein found. dA is greater than or equal to zero. The area of the event horizon never decreases in any physical process. And the third law, discussed to my knowledge, first by Werner Israel in the late 80s, is that no procedure can reduce the surface gravity of the black hole to zero in a finite number of steps. Extremal black holes, have the property that their surface gravity is zero. So they would be genuinely zero temperature objects. But uh, Israel's argument said that you cannot get to one of these things. Uh, if you start with a black hole that has positive surface gravity, you can never reduce it to zero in any finite number of steps. So, all right, what's black hole chemistry? Well, the four laws of black hole thermodynamics indicated once Hawking proved black holes could have temperature, these relationships. The energy, the thermodynamic energy was like the mass. The temperature corresponded to the surface gravity. And here I've included the h-bar factor. The entropy is like a quarter of the horizon area. And the first law you know, in thermodynamics uh, just a moment, corresponds to the first law of black hole mechanics. Yes, a question? Yeah. Uh, can you please go to the previous slide? Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we see that uh, no procedure can reduce the surface gravity to zero in a finite number of steps. But my point is now, why do you call it a black hole thermodynamics or black hole mechanics, but if the surface gravity is zero, how do I know that it corresponds to a black hole? Uh, well, I meant the surface gravity of a black hole. Yeah, but if, you, if some system has surface gravity zero, will we call it as a black hole? Well, I don't know of any other objects that have zero surface gravity that are not black holes. Um, uh, because they uh, would have, um, they all would have to have mass and some other properties. In the Reissner Nordstrom solution, you get it, as you probably know, by setting the mass equal to the charge, or maybe the charge equal to the mass. Yeah. Um, are there objects that it could have zero surface gravity that are not black holes? I am not aware of them, but I can't think off the top of my head of a proof that says there are no such things. Yeah, so it is mass equal to angular momentum. Those systems are again, those are extremal black holes. If, they, if we want to tell them that black holes, those are extremal black holes. And uh, uh, my worry was that if surface gravity is zero, then there is basically uh, area will also be affected. And I don't know whether I will call it a uh, event horizon has an area or not. And if it does not have, then can I claim still it's a black hole? That was, that's, my, that's, that's my worry. Well, I mean, that's a good question. I, I don't have a complete answer to it. Uh, it may be possible to invent some exotic object that, that does this. Again, this all of these presume positive energy. If you're willing to violate that constraint, then these things don't necessarily apply. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, so as I was saying, we have this correspondence, but if you compare the first laws, conspicuous by its absence is a pressure volume term, which appears in thermodynamics when you first learn it in high school, uh, in grade. 12 chemistry, for example. Where is this? And uh, Brian Dolan pointed out that this term is conspicuous by its absence. But it turns out that the cosmological constant uh, is related 
to this dilemma. Einstein introduced this quantity uh, shortly after he introduced general relativity because he wanted to obtain a static universe and he realized that if this quantity were absent, the universe would not be static. And at that time, there was a prejudice somewhat guided by what people thought was observation that the universe was eternal. Well, it's not eternal as we learned in the late 1920s, but 10 years earlier, Einstein thought, well, the way to get it to be that way is to introduce this constant lambda. And today it looks like there probably is a lambda or something very close to it uh, and that it's positive. But we call this thing dark energy now because we're not fully certain that uh, it is a constant. What we do know is to the very best of our knowledge, our universe is not only expanding, it is accelerating in its expansion. The simplest explanation of this consistent with the data is there is a positive, a small positive constant lambda, but we don't know that for sure. Meanwhile, at a theoretic end, string theory uh, has some very interesting formulations when lambda is negative. From a cosmological viewpoint, negative lambda can be interpreted as a fluid where uh, that has positive pressure, whereas positive lambda can be interpreted as a fluid that has negative pressure or what we would call tension. So in some sense, the basic idea of black hole chemistry is the bigger the negative lambda, the higher the pressure is of the system. So this idea was formalized by Castor, Ray, and Trashen about 11 years ago. And what they did is basically repeat the old Bardeen, Carter, Hawking arguments, but include a cosmological constant. And they came up with a different correspondence. Instead of energy being mass, it was thermodynamic enthalpy that is mass. Temperature and entropy still had the same correspondence, but now it turned out that there was a quantity called pressure, which was equal to negative lambda over eight pi g. So, so black holes in space times with zero lambda would be like zero pressure thermodynamic systems. But the first law now had a full correspondence and enthalpy became like mass. Enthalpy is energy plus PV. In other words, enthalpy is the energy it needs to create a system plus the energy you need to place it in an environment that will have a certain pressure and the object will occupy a certain volume. Well, when you have negative lambda, pressure is minus rho. So from a gravitational viewpoint, you could understand the mass of the black hole to be the total energy minus the energy of the vacuum. Now, formally, both of these are infinite, but if you properly subtract them using well-defined regulating procedures, you get a finite answer for the mass. There were antecedents of this idea in these other papers, one of them by Jolian Creighton, who's on the LIGO experiment now and me. Uh, we actually did show how you could put lambda into the first law, but what we never did is pursue uh, the thermodynamic implications of this. That turned out to need another 10 to 15 years. But Caldarelli, Cagnola, and Clem also proposed the idea later, and there are also antecedents in Padmanabhan's work uh, in, in the papers I've listed here. So what about this pressure from the vacuum? Well, let, it's easiestly, I think it's most easily understood by example. If you have a four-dimensional Schwarzschild anti-de Sitter black hole whose metric I have not written down, you can show that the mass is related to the event horizon by this equation, the temperature via this equation, the entropy is pi r plus squared, a quarter of the area, the pressure 
is negative lambda over eight pi, and lambda can be written as negative three over L squared. And it turns out the conjugate volume thermodynamically is like the Euclidean volume of the black hole. You can show that the first law is obeyed by taking differentials of these quantities. Just let L and R plus be the independent variables. It's a simple exercise in differential calculus to show this equation is true. But what you also find is this relationship here is true, a relationship called the SMAR formula. Without the pressure volume term, this relationship would not be true. Larry Smarr discovered in the 70s that all known black holes, at the time people weren't worrying about cosmological constants, all known black holes obeyed this M equals 2S property. But once cosmo black holes with cosmological constants were introduced, this was not obeyed. Castor, Ray, and Trashen showed, actually Brian Dolan, as well, that this will be obeyed if we take pressure volume into account. And here at the bottom of the slide is what I said earlier, that you can reinterpret lambda. Uh, if I have no stress energy, I just have the lambda term, I can put it on the right side of the equation, and I can define this to be a stress energy written as a perfect fluid where rho plus P is zero and uh, P is negative lambda just by comparing both sides of the equation. So a cosmological constant can be understood as a kind of fluid whose uh, pressure is equal in magnitude but opposite in sign to its density. Uh, sorry, Rabat, to, inter to interrupt you again. Uh, yep. I have some problem now. These two formulas Smart's formula about the mass at the fast look, looking at dm equal to t ds plus bdp. When yep. you compare that, it looks like the formula is true only for constant temperature and constant volume, right? Uh, it does, but it turns out if you take differentials both sides and work it out, uh, yeah. they agree. It's not immediately obvious. So it is not really. I, mean, I cannot conclude that this big formula is true for at constant temperature and contrast. Sorry, constant I, I didn't. Volume. You can't but conclude what I didn't. I didn't get that. But I will say that this change dm is equal to T ds plus P d p. Is this formula true for constant temperature and constant volume? Uh, well, I, I mean, it's true to the same extent that the black hole needs to be stationary and non-dynamical, yes. Uh, in other words, not by Eja, yes, that's true. There's a problem I see. To but see. the same assumptions required for the first law also are required for SMAR, if that's what you mean. Okay. The both, so it's a conspiracy looks like mass depends on the R plus, the band horizon. The volume yeah. depends on the R plus. And the volume remain to, volume to be constant, R plus has to be constant, and R plus has to be constant, and mass has to be constant. Then the oh, I see what you mean. But remember, I well, I think I see what you mean. You're taking differentials of the mass. Yes. Um, so suppose L is infinity, which is lambda is zero, then mm -hmm. M is R plus over two, right? So yeah. dm would be one half dr plus. Remember in the first law, you're imagining changing the mass a tiny little bit from one solution to a nearby solution. Mm -hmm. Changing the mass a tiny little bit if lambda is zero is like changing r plus a tiny little bit. Yes. When lambda is not zero, changing the mass a tiny little bit means you're changing this whole thing. Yeah. which means you're changing not only R plus, but also L. Okay. Whereas so, normally it, one would say, oh, L is a constant. I'm still only changing R plus. That's what, that's what I thought. Normally we say L is constant, yeah. but yeah. then we have a, a L is not constant dynamically. As you can see, pressure is related to one by L square, but if L is constant, dP has to be zero. 
but it is not zero. So it's a yeah. It's a, it's a the pressure is so it's a, the cosmological constant is not really a constant. It is changing over space time. Well, it's changing. You uh, the way one way to look at it is you're changing from solution to solution a little bit. Um, but you could imagine it being physical. If I had a black hole of mass m and I threw a little rock into it, it would yeah. become mass m plus delta m, and yes. we believe the delta m of the black hole would obey this law. But we also argued that if we do that, then the horizon also increases, right? That's correct, yes. Yeah, okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay? Yeah. All right. So um, what is this thermodynamic volume? Well, Castor, Ray, and Trashen gave a geometric formula for it which is the integral of this quantity here, where this thing, omega, is called a killing potential. And these are the unit normals to a, this is the time-like one, and this is the uh, radial one, to a, a two surface that surrounds your gravitational system. These are the unit normals when the surface goes to infinity, and you get the same integral over the horizon of the black hole, and you can subtract off, formally this is infinite, but you can define volume if you subtract off the uh, background that you would get if you only had anti-de Sitter space. Thermodynamically, the volume is the partial derivative of the mass with respect to pressure where you hold everything else constant. So for example, here, here is the uh, Schwarzschild ADS metric uh, that I made use of in the previous slide. Um, where V is this function right here, you can show, this is actually a bit, well, this V, this is a bad choice of notation, I realize, this V is this function, but the blue V is this, and it's four-thirds pi R plus cubed. In general, so you might think, oh, black hole uh, thermodynamic volume is geometric volume. Well, sometimes it is, but in general, it is not. For example, here is this Kerr solution I told you about, but now an anti de Sitter space. If you calculate the thermodynamic volume of this thing, you get this quantity right here, which is R plus times the area divided by three plus four pi A times the angular momentum divided by three. And the horizon area is given by this complicated formula where A is the rotation parameter. When L is infinity, you get The, the point of showing you this somewhat complicated example is to demonstrate that this term here does not give you the geometric volume. Furthermore, you can see that V depends like a power of R plus, and the area goes like a power of R plus for this solution. So V and S are not independent, but in general, they are independent when you have, for example, angular momentum. So this special case, don't be misled by it. Okay, so what does it mean? Well, we're still thinking about this, and I hope to get to this by the end of the talk. There's a geometric question that asks, what is the smallest area enclosing a given Euclidean volume, V? Well, the answer, I, I'll not leave you in suspense, is a spherical surface. If V, if, if we're in two dimensions, you can ask, what is the uh, shortest line that encloses an area of a given volume? The answer is a circle. And as you go up in dimensions, it becomes a spherical surface. So you can construct a ratio, a dimensionless ratio uh, of the volume to one over D minus one divided by the area to one over D minus two. This will have units of length. This will have units of one over length. And we normalize by uh, uh, the volume and area of unit spheres. This theorem says R is always less than or equal to one. Well, you can then do the same thing for black holes. Just make this the thermodynamic volume and this the thermodynamic area of the black hole. And 
Gibbons, uh, Svetich, uh, David Kubiznak, and Chris Pulp um, conjectured that all black holes obeyed what they called the reverse isoparametric inequality, that instead of this thing always being less than one, if you apply it to black holes, it should always be larger than one. And if I use the Kerr ADS example here, you can indeed show that here is what R, the ratio RBH looks like, and you can demonstrate this is indeed always greater than one, though I realize this is not obvious just by looking at it. So the physical interpretation is that for a given thermodynamic volume, the entropy of a black hole is maximized by the Schwarzschild ADS solution. And my point is, uh, or what I want to say is this theorem looked great, but we have since discovered that it is not always obeyed. And I'll hope to talk about that a bit later. Okay, so here is here are the basic equations of the chemistry of ADS black holes in a nutshell. A small change in mass is the heat term T delta S plus work terms, where now we include the pressure. And in ADS, um, you need to be sure that you're in a coordinate system where the angular momentum is zero, the angular velocity of your reference frame is zero at infinity. So depending on your coordinates, it sometimes becomes necessary to subtract that off. I'm working in multiple dimensions here where it is possible to have angular momentum pointing in more than one spatial direction once we have dimensions greater than four. For example, in five dimensions, a black hole can have two different angular momenta because we have two independent planes of rotation. What we do in studying this is to proceed as you would in thermodynamics. We look at the thermodynamic potential or the Gibbs free energy, which is the enthalpy minus the heat. And an equilibrium state will be any state where this quantity G is globally minimized. Local stability will be the positivity of the specific heat. And these are the criteria we apply along with these equations to study black hole chemistry. So what are the basic results? Well, I'm going to try and run through the four of them. These are the first four basic results that were found in these papers here. Um, we discovered that Hawking page transitions, known since the early 80s, actually are, look like solid liquid phase transitions in chemistry. Charged black holes can be interpreted as van der Waals fluids. We discovered also reentrant phase transitions and that black holes can have triple points analogous to the water's solid liquid gas triple point. So let me now run through these examples, I hope briefly. Suppose I have a Schwarzschild black hole in D dimensions. And I'm going to take change the metric function. Don't confuse this V with volume. I really should have used a different letter. Um, this quantity K can be one, zero, or negative one, depending on the horizon geometry, whether it's spherical, planar, or hyperbolic. Now, asymptotically flat black holes will evaporate by Hawking radiation. But if they are asymptotically anti de Sitter, the negative cosmological constant is like a confining box. So it will reflect the radiation back to the black hole and you can have a static black hole in thermal equilibrium with its own radiation. This is what Hawking and Page pointed out back in 1983. And what they did is they looked at the Gibbs free energy as a function of temperature and they got this curve that goes like so. The red means positive specific heat, the blue means negative specific heat. And what they said was that there is um, a point at which the Gibbs free energy goes to zero. If the temperature is colder than this point, then the black hole is unstable to dissolving into the thermal radiation. 
So at cold temperatures, you have radiation only. At hot temperatures, you have a black hole. In other words, thermodynamically, you will either have a large black hole at high temperatures. As the black hole shrinks, instead of becoming a small black hole with negative specific heat, the black hole instead will undergo a first order phase transition from being a black hole to becoming pure radiation and vice versa if you go in the other direction. This minimum temperature here is where this cusp occurs and below this, it is not possible to have any black holes at all, stable or not. This would be interpreted as a gas of particles, perhaps a gas of gravitons. Now, uh, David and I showed in this paper that if you allow the cosmological constant to be interpreted as pressure, you can draw a curve, a pressure temperature curve uh, that shows where the two phases coexist. And radiation is cold temperatures. Black hole is hot for any given pressure if you draw horizontal lines. The higher the pressure, the bigger this curves go. This is like a coexistence curve of a solid liquid phase transition. The coexistent line is infinite. And for some substances, if they're hot enough at any pressure, there will always be liquids. And if they're cold enough at any pressure, there will always be solids. The equation of state, if you take the temperature and let L go like L squared go like one over the pressure and rewrite this, you obtain this equation of state in if D equals four in this case, where K is the curvature of the horizon. So you can see if K is zero, we have PV equals T, or as I learned in high school, PV equals NRT, the equation of an ideal gas. So in other words, a planar black hole obeys the ideal gas law. Now, one of the quantities we're going to be using here is called the specific volume. And it is uh, basically the ratio of the thermodynamic volume to the number of degrees of freedom. And the number of degrees of freedom of a black hole is generally thought to be the area over the Planck length squared. So if you take these quantities, the thermodynamic volume divided by the area, you get twice the Planck length squared times R plus. And it is often very useful to make use of this specific volume because it's proportional to the horizon radius. And I will be doing that a lot here. All right. Well, this subject got going for me when David and I looked at charged black holes, where now I've modified the metric function, not the thermodynamic volume, I've really got to change this notation, um, to include electric charge. And uh, one can compute temperature, entropy, and electric potential, as well as pressure and volume, which still turns out to be this, whether the, uh, e even if the hole has charge. And you can show that these quantities together obey both the Smarr relation and the first law. That's not difficult. And from the temperature, you can construct the equation of state. Just replace L squared by P according to this relation and solve this for P and you obtain this equation right here. And this equation, if we rescale things in units of Planck length, we found that pressure went like the actual, physical pressure went like the actual physical temperature times this constant. So that caused us to identify this quantity as the specific volume that I mentioned on the previous slide. And writing things in those units, we now have this. So you can see the ideal gas law in the first term. Here's a term that cares about the geometry of the horizon, note it's negative, and here's a positive term due to the charge. This is, the van this is just like Van der Waals equation for a black hole. Now, a Van der Waals fluid obeys this equation here, which is not exactly the equation I showed you before, but it does have this qualitative feature that it has a local minimum, a local maximum, 
goes up at high, uh, small volume and decreases at, at large volume. The parameter A measures the attraction between molecules in the fluid, and B corresponds to an irreducible fluid volume. They have a critical point where these max and min are equal, where this curve has a point of inflection, and that is true at a specific critical pressure, critical volume, and critical temperature that turns out to be three eighths. What David and I found is that if you take Van der Waals equation that we had for the charged black hole, you get qualitatively exactly the same behavior, even with exactly the same critical point. And that's done in, in this paper here and a follow up in higher dimensions in this paper here, along with Sharmila Gunasekaran. There was a full correspondence uh, between the two. And this was now like a, a liquid gas phase transition where here's pressure, here's temperature. The coexistence line of the phases terminates at a critical point, PC, VC, and TC, where uh, beyond this, you cannot distinguish whether it is a liquid or a gas. And of course, this happens for fluids all the time. We found that the clausius clapeyron and Ehrenfest equations are satisfied and that we, we could compute critical exponents from mean field theory and they look just like the mean, the, the, well, we could compute the critical exponents of the theory and they were just like mean field theory. So this is for liquid gas, black holes, small to large, obey the same thing. Small is like liquid, large is like gas. We also discovered a little later on something called a reentrant phase transition, which I had never heard of before I did this. Uh, what it is, is if you monotonically vary a thermodynamic quantity like temperature or like pressure, uh, if that variation results in two or more phase transitions such that the final state is macroscopically the same as the initial state, you have a reentrant phase transition. And this was first observed in nicotine and water, where a guy named Hudson took a fluid mixture of water and nicotine and studied how it varied for various temperatures and various pressures. And here's a picture from his 1904 paper. Well, at these, at, let's take this pressure here. At high temperatures, there is only one phase, water and nicotine mix. But as you cool it off, they separate where the nicotine floats above the water. I think, or is it the other way around? Maybe, no, the water, I guess, floats above the nicotine. But as you cool it down, they mix together again. And the microscopic explanation of this is that at these cold temperatures, it's cold enough for the water to polar bond with the nicotine and so they mix. Well, this phenomenon is being observed in many other systems as is reviewed in this paper here. And we saw it in black holes. We saw it by studying phase transitions in the Kerr-Newman black hole and here is the Kerr-Newman ADS solution uh, with the various thermodynamic parameters given in terms of the parameters of the, of the metric. I know this is complicated and can't be fully absorbed. Notice the volume is no longer just the Euclidean, the thermodynamic volume is no longer the Euclidean volume. There is still a small to large transition with a critical point but now the critical pressure volume temperature is no longer 3 eighths, it turns out to be 5 twelfths. But below that point, there is a first order phase transition across this line as exemplified by this swallowtail feature in oopsie daisy, free energy versus temperature. At high pressures, there's no swallowtail, but you reach a critical point below which a swallowtail forms. So you, you go up and you have a large black hole here, but then it jumps to being a small black hole along that line. Sorry, can I have a question? Sure. 
So, so my question actually goes back um, to your paper with David um, that you just studied the ADS charge black hole phase transition and thermodynamics. Yep. My question is that I'm convinced that black holes are like thermodynamical systems by themselves, as you explained. But uh, I actually uh, want to ask that, uh, what does exactly phase transition physically mean for black holes? Uh, well, that's very clear that all the equations and even all the diagrams is swallow tail behavior or all the diagrams you showed are just similar to Van der Waals uh, fluid. But uh, I'm actually a bit confused that what does that physically mean? Like okay, there are a couple of ways of understanding this. Suppose you were an advanced civilization and you were capable of crushing matter into black holes. And suppose you were able to do this in some environment where you could control the temperature. Now, suppose you're doing this properly, you're behaving here at high temperatures where it's safe. But then hooligans, teenage kids, I shouldn't do that, but you know, anyway, some kids come in maybe, and then they change the dials of the gizmo and they try to create a black hole at these hot, at the, a cold black hole that is big. Well, they could do it, but it would be up here and then it would destabilize to a small black hole by emitting a burst of radiation, I would say. So that's one way of understanding it. Um, now that's very hypothetical. Another way is to say this advanced civilization, this is also hypothetical, has the gas of big black holes inside a big box. And then they control the temperature of the box, making it lower and lower. Well, as they do, one of the big holes will suddenly become a little one. And then another big hole will become little. And, and so on and so on until eventually they all become little, just the way that gas slowly condenses into liquid as you lower the temperature. Does that make sense? Um, yes, actually, I can understand what you mean. But uh, if I really consider like a, a really a black hole system, let's say in the center of the galaxy or so, still it's not very meaningful for me the phase transition and the idea of going through like a small ra uh, small uh, event horizon radius to a bigger one uh, by i mean uh, uh, i believe that all the things is just uh, somehow related to the pressure the change of the uh, lambda uh, so still well i'll get to that in a minute but notice if i fix the pressure Right? Suppose I take a look at this diagram here. Suppose I take any constant pressure uh, below this value. Then you will get a small to large transition. You don't need lambda to vary to get this transition. You need to vary lambda to find what the transition will look like. But once you've found it, if you don't have the ability to change lambda, that's okay. As long as lambda is in this range, as you raise the temperature, you're going to go from small to big. Think of it the other way around. Suppose I have a small black hole and I put it in a box and I make the box hotter and hotter. Well, the black hole will get a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, but all of a sudden it will go, it will gulp down a huge amount of radiation and become big all of a sudden. That's that. If this is right, that is what this means. Oh, okay. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, I've got a lot to cover. I don't know if I, are you guys still good to keep going or do we need to pause for a minute? Uh, it's okay for me. What would you like to do? Uh, maybe after 10 minutes, you give a pause for 10 minutes. Okay, we'll pause at 1030 for a little bit, okay? Yes. Okay, so if we look, let's, we explored this further. And here is the metric for one black holes with one rotation parameter in higher dimensions. You can see the mass, angular momentum, temperature, and so on are complicated. But you can show that these do obey Smar and First Law. And what we discovered was this. We looked at this in five dimensions and found the usual swallowtail structure, large to small. But when we looked at six dimensions, 
we discovered the swallowtail was just a little bit different. And I'm going to zoom in on this thing. We called it at first a zero with order phase transition. Let's enlarge this box. Now notice what happens to the swallowtail here. It doesn't continue all the way to zero. It terminates. So what this means is if I started with a big black hole and could control the temperature, as it gets colder, I would undergo a large to small transition. But once I reached T naught, I cannot proceed any further along this curve. The only way to make it colder is to jump up to here. So the black hole would go from large to small to large. The specific heat is positive everywhere on the red line, so they would be stable. And I have the first example of a re-entrant phase transition for a black hole. If I plot pressure versus temperature, I get a, a big coexistence curve, but a teeny tiny little one here that if I enlarge shows I go from large, oopsie daisy, well here's the diagram again, large to small to large. We call this intermediate because this isn't quite as large as this one, but it's definitely larger than that. This is just like what Hudson found, just a sec, like what Hudson found, we go from mixed uh, to separate to mixed, we go from big to small to big. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so in, in these uh, solutions, what is the value of L you have taken? What value, sorry? Small L, cosmological constant. Okay, you'd have to convert it from pressure. It only happens for pressures in this narrow range. If okay. you're below the, if you're above this range, you only have the usual small to large thing. And if you're down here, then you yeah. just have large. So it is only true for a narrow range, and it was true for a particular value of the angular momentum, though there are ranges of angular momentum where this qualitative behavior occurs. Okay. The but it's definitely have, there in this range. Yeah. The other point I have is that since now the metric and the black hole characterization depends on the cosmological constant, uh, should we also consider that in an ideal space or even digital space, the Noer theorem should also accept the cosmological constant? Well, they would have to be revised to include the cosmological constant. Um, the conserved quantities are still conserved, but I, I'm going to be looking at things where black holes do have hair so I don't know that I could say much more of that. That's assuming I can get to them. Yeah, but the other, uh, the other point I saw in your metric is that if I take the value of cosmological constant to zero, it's already it's not going a smooth limit to the uh, usual plane or Minkowski. Well, yeah, it depends. That's right. If you're in here, then yeah, yeah you don't get a smooth limit right at that point. If that's what you mean, that's true. But you do okay. if you're down here. Okay. Go ahead. Um, anyway, this, as I said, this was found in many examples that we outlined in this paper six years ago. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so we also found triple points for multiply rotating black holes. If I have black holes with two rotation parameters, which is possible in dimensions five and larger, then I found this swallowtail structure at high pressures, no swallowtail, lower pressures, one swallowtail, but at even lower pressures still, we get two swallowtails, one here and one there, and they can merge together right there at what we call a triple point. And when you construct the analogous pressure temperature curve, you get what is called a tricritical or triple point where a large black hole and a small black hole and an intermediate black hole can exist. So this one is big, this one is middle, this one is tiny. In this pressure zone, I go 
from small to big to bigger, but right here, they are indistinguishable. Just like ice, steam, and water can exist in the same phase. So that's the black hole triple point. We have never found more than a triple point, though the hunt, I think, uh, hope remains eternal that we might be able to find a black hole system that has four distinct phases that meet in one point. But I have yet to find it. That is uh, an unsolved problem at this point in history. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, in this tricritical point, I just want to remember, I just forgot uh, this particular thing. Uh, when uh, uh, we arrive at the tri triple point, it is true that this uh, three states coexist together. So what happens yeah. to the uh, this uh, critical exponents at that point? Um, they are still the same. But it turns out there are other black holes with different critical exponents that I hope to get to soon. We're almost at the break. So let me just give a preview of what we'll, I'll try to do after the break. Um, oh. Our more exotic phenomena that are given in these papers uh, here. And I'll hope to go through this quickly because I also want to get to brand new stuff. But maybe, can we take a break here for how long? Yeah. Uh, I hope not more than five minutes. Robert, Robert, before you take the break, suppose you discover the fourth point, will you, will you call it plasma state or some other state? Yeah. You will call it plasma uh, state? Sorry, what, what is the question? Uh, suppose you observe the fourth state, not liquid, not gas, and um, uh, you will observe a fourth state as you are thinking that you'll go and get there. I, my question is, what do you name it? Oh, well, I don't know. I guess I would probably name it whatever looked to be the closest counterpart in, in the real world. Well, in the real uh, world... Maybe I'd know. call it a black hole plasma. I don't know. Maybe I'd yeah, call it a black yeah, hole okay. polymer. I don't know. I was um, just putting your leg that whether you will stick to black hole plasma or you want to give a different name. <laughs> I'm agnostic on this. I would wait to see what properties it had before naming it. Okay, Robert, let me introduce myself. My name is Sudhakar Panda. We had a full afternoon many years ago in Trieste in ICTP. We discussed. Yeah. I'm sure that you have forgotten me, but I still remember you. And uh, Oh boy, it yeah, I, it's been a long time. Yes, yes, yes. At the time, you were talking also to Utpal Sarkar, and he was my collaborator. We discussed whole afternoon in the Adriatic building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, that's been a long, boy, that's 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay can we stop here for a few minutes and reconvene in, in, I don't know, three minutes, five minutes? Five minutes, maybe. Okay, so 10.35, we'll come back. Okay. Okay. So guys, please ask questions after he, when he's back. And uh, the thing is, Gabriel, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. So when he, he comes back, you please uh, ask him about the thing you are. Yeah. Asking. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I was I was about to do that. I hope it wasn't. Yeah, I hope yeah. it wasn't appropriate. Uh, sir, I'm enjoying it, but my God, Sh Shudhakar, sir. Oh. Shudhakar, sir. Yes. Yeah. I want to introduce one of my students from University of Waterloo, Gabriel. So he was the co-author of our previous paper. Uh, okay. Please do it. Let me show. It. Let me see his face. Gabriel, can you show uh, your maybe. face, please? Uh huh. Yep. Let me. I'm um, trying to. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, let me see. Yeah. I am not. Uh, uh, I'm the one of the. Well, yeah, you can see me. Go ahead. Yeah, I put the video. So, Gabriel is from University of Waterloo. 
Yeah, where is Gabriel? I have not seen it. Seen him. So he is there. I can able to I see can. him. Can you I see can. me? Ah, now I see. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Hi. Thank you for being with us. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm enjoying it. It was. Uh... I didn't get as much sleep as I wanted to, so I sort of woke up while processing information. It's really interesting. I find it, uh, yeah, I find he's doing a great job making the math very accessible, which is, I'm, I'm really enjoying. I'm just in now why it's such a great look. Anton is now back to my institute and be with us. Sometimes we'll be able to discuss and carry forward our projects in the positive sure. direction. Yeah, okay. Sure, that'd be great. And and what's your what's your name? Because it just shows admin. My name is Sudhakar Panda. Oh, okay. okay and yeah. I'm so here. the name before your name in the paper. Oh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So I I actually still waking up. with me in the last two papers. Yes, fine. Yeah, good. And I, I met Gabriel at Perimeter Institute. He was there in my talk. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, once, the, once this COVID period is over, plan to come over to India? Uh, uh, I would like to. Uh, I, yeah, no, I would definitely love to do that. Uh, I don't once do travel much, is up and going again. I don't do much physics nowadays. Because I am the director of this mm. institute and busy with the administrations most of the time, and mm. uh, uh, but still come over. We can still talk sometimes, discuss few things. Yeah, definitely. yeah, yeah. And even before COVID, if you want to have like a, a Zoom meeting or whatever every now and then, yeah, I'm pretty free there. to just yes, do. Come here. Yeah. Let me see how it goes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like uh, once he's come uh, comes back, uh, Gabriel, please ask him about the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll ask him about it, and then I'll stick around for as long as I can before sleep inevitably washes over me again. Okay, it is night at my place, and I am not doing good things, so I am going out of my video. <laughs> All right. Ooh, so how do you how do you know Robert Mann, Satyam? Do you know him from just did you just email him from around? Did you know him from PI? No, I just uh, actually contacted him by seeing the faculty lists and all, and also your professor recommended me to talk to him. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you. I still haven't thanked Joe for that. I should thank Joe for. I'm I'm glad you guys got in contact because. Yeah. yeah, I think Joe's quite a nice person. I'm very lucky that I'm able to work with him. I may be working with him next term too, as well. Actually, I don't. I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing next. So I did. I don't know if I told you. I got an interview at uh, IQC, which was fun. I ended up not getting the position, um, but like it's the person I interviewed with was very nice. So we're still in contact. I'm hoping to do something with that, maybe down the line. Um, but I did get my first interview with him. I bought the paper. Hi, Ebin. How are you? Sorry, what? I'm asking that. How are you? No, I'm doing good. How are things in India? It's okay. I just have reached, I'm right now quarantined. Sorry, what? Quarantined. Oh, right. You're done with quarantine now or you're still in quarantine? No, no, I'm right now in quarantine. Okay, okay. And, and how hey, is the... Should we, should okay. we start again? Sure, sure. Just before we do, if I could ask, um, would you be interested in hosting a seminar at Waterloo as well? I'm here for my own time, but I'm also helping run a Fizz 10 this term. A lot of background noise is coming. Abhinash, could you please yeah. mute your... Sorry, was that question directed at me? Yes. Yes, I should have made that more clear. Yes, sorry. 
and, and the question is, would it be okay to host a seminar at Waterloo? What, what yeah, do you mean? Well, like, what do you have in mind? I mean, the answer is yes, but what are you thinking of? Do you know um, the, the Fizz 10 seminar series? Yes. Uh, we're, doing, we're doing that this term and we're holding it, hosting it online through Microsoft Teams, similar to uh -huh. this. And we still have some slots open in December if you're interested. Oh, so you want me to do a Fizz 10. Is that the idea? Yes. If you're available. Oh, sure. I can do that. Um, send me an email and uh, uh, I will, uh, uh, you know, we'll find a date, okay? Sure, definitely. If, and anything, I'm loving this talk as well. So anything like this as well would be really interesting. I'll contact you after this and I'll still okay. be watching this. But okay. I'll just for now. All right. I've got a lot of other ground to cover. I'm not sure I'll get through it all. So let me go ahead. Okay. Um, after finding these basic uh, properties, we then discovered there were a number of more exotic phenomena in these papers here, things like isolated critical points, multiple reentrant phase transitions, uh, superfluidity, and I, I don't know that I can go through all of them in detail. Um, these phenomena are generally seen when you have higher curvature gravity and or black holes with scalar hair. So let me say a little bit about higher curvature gravity. Uh, we studied um, black hole chemistry and Lovelock gravity, which is um, given by, uh, it, it's a theory where instead of just having a constant term plus the Ricci scalar in the gravitational action, you have terms higher in the curvature. This term here is quadratic. It has two powers of curvature in every term. And it's called the Gauss-Binet term. And a guy named Lovelock, who was a professor at the University of Waterloo in the 1970s, discovered that there were certain combinations of curvature tensors. This is the simplest non-trivial one that when you put them together the field and, and computed the field equations, they were still second order differential equations. Whereas normally this is not true. If I just took the square of the Riemann tensor or the square of the Ricci scalar in the action and did a variational principle, I would get differential equations greater than second order. But Lovelock gravity has this feature that the differential equations are always second order and the kth term is this combination of Riemann curvature tensors contracted with this anti-symmetric Kronecker delta here. The um, value of k has to be smaller than what dimension minus one over two. So for example, if you are in four dimensions, then k has to be one uh, or less, which is the linear term. But in five dimensions, k could be as large as two. And then you have the Gauss-Binet. In seven dimensions, you could have a cubic term. In nine dimensions, you could have the quartic term. There are two special cases of this kind of theory, depending on the values of these coupling constants alpha. One of them is called Chern-Simons gravity where the alphas are all related to each other by this. The other is where the alphas are related by this expression, depending on big K, and that gives what we call an isolated critical point. So here are the equations of motion. They're analogous to Einstein gravity, except instead of being linear in curvature, you can have quadratic, cubic, and so on but you still set a function of curvature equal to the stress energy and solve. Now, you can exactly solve these equations when you have spherical symmetry, and the answer is given by solving this polynomial. If I insert this metric and this onsatz into this equation, onsatz for the electric field into this equation for the stress energy, then I obtain this polynomial in the metric function f. 
And so if I solve this polynomial for F, I have an exact solution. Einstein gravity has capital K equals one. The equation is linear in F and it will give the Reissner Nordstrom ADS solution. If I have gauss bonnet gravity when K is two, the equation is quadratic and I get this solution down here. In general, there are K branches, uh, K branches of solutions. Um, one of them will reduce to Einstein gravity as the higher couplings vanish, the others will not. In the case at the bottom, if I choose the minus branch, when alpha two goes to zero, I will recover uh, Reissner Nordstrom ADS. But if I choose the plus branch, that will not happen. Now, what we discovered in this paper here with uh, Antonia Fresino, David Kubisnak, and Phil Samovich is we discovered four phenomena. Uh, this C should be up there. We found you could have reverse van der Waals phase transitions. We found isolated critical points. We found multiple reentrant phase transitions and we discovered a thermodynamic singularity. And they are symbolized by these diagrams here that change the max min structure in various ways in the diagram. So here is reverse van der Waals behavior that happens when the rate it, for cubic Lovelock theory, we have an alpha three and an alpha two. And when the quadratic and cubic couplings are related in this ratio, others are possible, but this is the first one we found. Then you find the following. This red line is above the critical point. And as the temperature goes down, you can see we develop the usual van der Waals curve where we have a maximum and a minimum. So if I start at large volumes and compress the volume, I reach a point at this dotted line where the gas condenses into a liquid until it's all liquid and then you get high pressure. But we also find that as you increase the temperature, you again get a max min structure. So that is what we call a reverse van der Waals transition, where you get a phase transition at hotter temperatures instead of colder ones. And here is how you can understand this uh, from a diagram of the free energy versus temperature, here's a 3D one with pressure. But if I take a pressure slice, various pressure slices this way, this way, this way, then I can start at a large black hole down here. When I reach this intersection point, I follow this new curve for the global minimum where I'm in a small black hole. But when I reach this intersection point here, it becomes large but then I reach the end of this, it terminates, and then I jump back to a small. So I go large, small, large, small. So that is a double reentrant phase transition. We also found isolated critical points when the ratio of couplings looked like this. And that happened where you could have this minima and maxima and inflection point intersect at a particular temperature. Now, I was asked earlier about mean field theory. Most black holes obey mean field theory. And if you take the equation of state relating pressure, temperature, and volume, and do a series expansion about the critical point, you end up getting this expression. And these exponents tell you the critical exponents. This three gives you this delta tilde, for example. And um, I believe this fact to the power one gives you this gamma and so on. But when you have this ratio, we discovered at that point there, we got non-standard critical exponents where beta was one instead of a half, gamma was two instead of one. 
Alpha and delta were still the same. So here's delta, but notice gamma, instead of being one, is now given by two. So, uh, Robert, you want to mean that the scaling laws, which we uh, uh, like remember from uh, condensed matter side also, which we call some Rushbrooke scaling laws, that has to be violated, I think. Well, they're not. They are still satisfied. That's on my next uh, slides here. Um, okay. well, I'll get to that. But yes, that's a very good question. Um, in this other paper, uh, we studied this in more detail and discovered that for a kth order Lovelock theory, when the couplings are related like so, the metric has function has this particular solution and you get this special kind of equation of state. Robert, where, I, have a, I, I have a question now if you go back to your previous slide. For which slide? Previous slide. Okay. Oopsie daisy, uh, what did I do there? Oh, that was a disaster. Um, okay. Let me go back and find that previous slide. Somehow what I did um, uh, here we go. You mean this one? Uh, no, the next one. This one. Uh, this one? The one I was asking is that, yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's the previous slide. Okay, what would you like? My question is that, is there a possibility of choosing such alpha, such a value that I can go pressure to negative? That you can what? Sorry? Pressure can go to negative. Is it possible? I still didn't get the question that I can do what? Uh, can you go slower, please? This is a question for, this is a graph for pressure versus volume, right? Yes. But I give in value of alpha. Yes. My, my question is that can I have an alpha such that the pressure can go down? And I'm sure you know why I'm asking that question if pressure can be negative where the pressure goes down and then what happens? Can it go yeah, to negative? Pressure can be negative or not? No, right. no. I will not no, try once to... you're negative, you change the asymptotic structure of the theory. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Well, my, I, I was thinking that if I can construct such a situation where pressure can be negative, then I, I'm in business with cosmology. Well, I'll get to that later if I can. So you've got good questions, but they're all precognitive. So let me, I'll, I'll get to that later, I hope. Um, what we found was that if you had the alphas related like so, and if the kappa term describing the curvature of this was negative, then you could have an isolated critical point which is basically the merging of two first order phase transitions. And what we discovered, just clicking through the formulas, is the equation of state, when you expand it about the critical point, where tau is t over tc or t minus tc over tc, and omega is v minus vc over vc, that you got omega to the k minus one, which meant delta was k, or sorry, omega to the k here, which meant delta was k, and an omega k to the minus one tau, which meant gamma was k minus one. So we found they had non-critical, non-standard critical exponents. So the scaling relations, as was I was asked a few minutes ago, a uh, few minutes ago, were violated. Um, originally, we found this happened near something called a thermodynamic singularity, but we've later discovered these are independent features and you can have a, an isolated critical point without that in, in this paper here. So what I want to do is show the behaviors in a normal van der Waals phase transition, you've got large to small with a critical point. When you have a reverse one, this line is broken. So you have a normal one here, and then you have another critical point and, and the first order reemerges along this red curve. An isolated critical point happens 
when the parameters are such that this critical point and this critical point merge together at exactly the same place, when they just touch each other. And then, that's why we call it isolated, if you go beyond those parameters, then we get an infinite coexistence line. We discovered, to get now to the question I was asked a little while ago, the Widom relation, the Rushbrook inequality, and the Ehrenfest relations are all satisfied. And there is a quantity one can compute in polymer physics called the Prigogine de Faye ratio. And it turns out to be one over K, where K is that maximum value of the power of the curvature. And this suggested that we have a kind of liquid glass phase transition. In other words, it looks like some black holes can have glassy properties. And we have found similar phenomena for quasi-topological black holes, as they're called, not just Lovelock. The point I want to get to is here is a graph of of um, various polymers with the Prigogine de Fay ratio plotted on the horizontal axis here, and here is the value of one. And you can see most of the, there is some other correlation coefficient that doesn't matter here. You can see that most polymers have values greater than one, but some of them have values less than one. And so we thought that maybe these are polymeric black holes or glassy black holes. These objects merit further study in my view. We don't know very much more about them. Okay, let me get to superentropic black holes briefly. These are a new uh, ultra spinning limit that we found to the class of Kerr black hole metrics and they have non-compact horizons that have finite energy, area, sorry. They are asymptotically ADS, but they have a boundary that rotates at the speed of light. And they became of interest because they were the first counterexamples to the reverse isoparametric inequality. So you find them like this. We did it in this paper here with Roby Hennigar and David Kubisnak. Um, you start with a Kerr-Newman ADS black hole and basically redefine this as a muthal coordinate by absorbing this parameter chi in there. And then you let A approach L. Now when A is goes to L, chi goes to zero, which looks like phi go, psi goes to infinity, but then you compactify psi, which you're allowed to do, and you end up with this metric right here which was discovered by Clem shortly before we wrote this paper. In fact, Clem's paper inspired us to make this construction. And what you find here is the uh, super entropic black hole, as we call it. Here are the thermodynamic parameters. And the first law becomes this, where we now have a new work term, where mu is uh, kind of like uh, uh, a tension associated with the black hole, and K is its thermodynamic conjugate. It's a chemical potential of sorts. And we found these things had a number of interesting properties. They could be, you could put charge on them, and you had both extremal and non extremal solutions. They did not have closed time like curves. The horizon, as I said, is non-compact. If you set R and T to constant, then the metric on the horizon is this. And you might, and if you let kappa be L times one minus cos theta, you see that you, you find you get a kind of hyperbolic structure on the horizon. It's kind of like a Lobachevsky space. And um, it is non-compact. Kappa could go from minus infinity to infinity, but this area is finite. If you embed the horizon in three space, it looks kind of like this onion where this stretches up to infinity. They have an ergosphere, 
But what was quite curious from the viewpoint of black hole chemistry is they violated the reverse isoparametric inequality. If you calculate that ratio R I told you about, you find it is indeed less than one. So that's why we called them super entropic. If you remember the interpretation, these black holes have more entropy than they should have given their thermodynamic volume. Whereas other black holes have the entropy bounded. They, these exceed that bound. We also, a couple of years ago, discovered superfluid black holes, where instead of a, a second order phase transition at a point, we discovered a line of continuous second order phase transitions, just like the kind of transition helium makes when it becomes superfluid. We found these for hairy black holes in higher dimensions, and now we found them in a broad class of other theories. So here is the phase diagram for helium-4. And this line here is when it goes from a normal fluid to a superfluid. There are other phases here, but the key point is this is a line of second order transitions. And the what happens in these black holes is the hair modifies the equation of state by this additional term. Um, where if you notice, here's the ideal gas term. Here's the term due to curvature of the horizon. This is a term due to charge. The hair term falls off faster than the horizon term, but slower than the charge term. And because of that, you can actually find the critical points and you discover that the critical points depend on the critical temperature like so for all critical temperatures. Whereas previous to this, the critical pressure did not depend on the critical temperature. But here we get a line. As we raise the critical temperature, we raise the critical pressure. There are infinitely many critical points. So you get a line of transitions um, from, uh, normal black hole to superfluid along what is called a lambda line in the field. And if you plot the specific heat at constant pressure for the black hole, you get a curve like this, oopsie daisy, which looks exactly like the lambda lot, like, like the uh, uh, curve for specific heat for helium four. So uh, this shows, oh, and the critical exponents are, are the same as usual here. That also happens here. So it looks like black holes can have superfluidic type properties. Okay, how am I doing? Um, do you have stamina for me to go to the frontiers or should we stop? Anybody still left? Should I continue? Hello? I can't hear anybody. Yeah, no, 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 I'm here. Please continue. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the new things that have been done in the last three years since the review appeared. Um, there's a lot of papers on this and more than I can list where we've looked at what happens in positive lambda to sitter space time where we have cosmic tension. Uh, we've looked at cosmic solitons. Uh, people have discovered black holes have heat engines. We've looked at the ADS CFT correspondence. We've discovered accelerating black holes have thermodynamic properties. We've begun to get the first hints of what black hole chemistry means for black hole microstructure and very recently, we've discovered an interesting relationship between black hole complexity and, and black, hole uh, black hole chemistry. So cosmic tension. Um, in this paper here, uh, David uh, Kubiznak, David Castor, Jenny Trash, and Brian Dolan and I asked, what, happened, what happens if lambda is positive? 
so that pressure is negative, which we would call tension. Can you construct a first law? And the answer is yes. In fact, you get two first laws and two SMA relations, one at the black hole and one at the cosmological de Sitter horizon. Because whenever you have a positive cosmological constant, you are going to get a cosmological horizon. And there is a first law at each place. The notable difference between this equation and that one is the sign here. The heat contributes positively to a change in mass at the event horizon, but negatively at the cosmological horizon. But nevertheless, these follow from the uh, extension of the Bardeen-Carter-Hawking arguments. And just to show you what this can look like and how messy it can be, this is the metric for a multiply rotating Kerr de Sitter black hole in D dimensions. It has two horizons and each are at a different temperature. You can see it's a very complicated structure. But you can show that for both even dimensional black holes and odd, that it is possible to compute the thermodynamic parameters at the Cosmo horizon and at the black hole horizon. And these respect the first law and the SMAR formula. This is for odd. This is for even. Notice there are slight changes between the two. What about that reverse isoparametric inequality? Well, this argument that I don't have time to go into, but I'm just showing you the details have been worked out. You find that the ratio, this ratio depends on a parameter Z, which is given by this quantity in purple. And you can regard this ratio as a function of this parameter Z. And you can show that when Z is zero, F is one, and that the derivative of this function with respect to Z is positive. So therefore, the reverse ratio is always obeyed for these whether you're de Sitter or whether it's anti de Sitter, or rather I should say the other, whether it's anti de Sitter or whether it is de Sitter. But that's at the black hole. Can we understand what goes on at the cosmological horizon? What is the meaning of thermodynamic volume for a cosmo horizon? Well, a student of mine, Selson Mubarak and I decided to look at this and we, we are there any, the way you can look at this is to try and study a solution that has only a cosmological horizon, but not a black hole. Well, de Sitter space is one example, but it's too simple. We studied cosmic solitons, which are objects that have a cosmological horizon, but instead of a black hole, there is a bubble in space-time here. So the space-time ends at this surface. And if you try to keep going, you'll just get reflected to another place. Rick Clarkson and I discovered these about 14 years ago. And the key point of this study here was to ask what are the thermodynamics of this thing and how does the volume behave on its own? Because these are solutions that where the black hole is not there to complicate things. So here's what the solutions look like for the metric. You can see that um, there is a function G that will vanish when R equals L. That's the Cosmo horizon, very similar to de Sitter. But there is another function F that will vanish when R equals A. And that is the edge of the soliton. Notice this function does not appear here. It appears here. So when R equals A, this term vanishes. And you will get, that is why it is the edge of the space time. If you go to R less than A, then this goes negative and you change the signature of the metric. So the way you deal with this is by making sure the periodicity of psi is such that you have regularity of the space time when F vanishes. Uh, that's that condition in purple. 
So we have now a cosmological horizon surrounding this bubble at R equals A. And you can compute the mass uh, by two different means, both from the perspective of observers inside the horizon and observers outside the cosmological horizon, and the effect is to change the sign, as well as the thermodynamic volume. And what we discovered is the reverse isoparametric inequality was violated in all cases, in all dimensions. So this suggests that cosmological volume may not probably does not have the same meaning that, that, that black hole volume does. Is there a better way of controlling how to study the positive lambda case? Well, Phil Samovich and I looked at this recently in a couple of papers, and all I'm showing you are the diagrams that are the result. The coexistence law, what we do, sorry, is put the black hole in a cavity. And the reason for that is the cosmological horizon has a temperature that differs from the event horizon. And therefore, you no longer have thermodynamic equilibrium. But a way of dealing with this that Karlip and Vaija suggested about 17 years ago is to put the black hole in a cavity. And you can control, you could imagine an advanced civilization controlling the temperature of the cavity in which case um, you, can then, you can then have thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, no one has ever studied this before when, when lambda is variable, but Phil and I did. And we discovered the coexistence line had two critical points, one here, one there. And, and that is a result of what we call the swallow two, that here's one critical point, here's the other critical point, so for pressures above and below this, we have indistinguishable phases. But in this region here, in this range of pressures, we can distinguish between large and small black holes. So the swallow tail becomes a swallow tube. Another structure is uh, that of heat engines, which Clifford Johnson suggested. He suggested, well, if black holes are thermodynamic this way, then we can take them around heat cycles and you can calculate how much, how efficient they are. If you started, for example, a black hole here at some pressure and volume, compressed it at constant temperature, then raised the pressure at constant volume, then let it expand at constant temperature, and then, and then lowered the pressure. This is what an automobile engine does. This is the Carnot cycle, and the efficiency of it is known to be one minus the cold over the hot temperature. And Johnson pointed out that these black holes can have this same property. And so people, as in this paper, began to explore this kind of thing. It's, it's just like what motivated thermodynamics in the first place. People wanted to understand engine efficiency, where you have a hot system, a cold system, and you let heat flow between them, but you can steal some work due to that transfer of heat, but only with this efficiency. Well, um, Maybe I'll skip this slide and go to the next one. Uh, in this paper, we looked at how you could maximize the efficiency of these black holes by taking a whole variety of black holes and having the engine cycle be in a circle. The idea of the circle was there would be no particular prejudice for any kind of um, heat cycle, whether it was Rankine or Carnot and so on. And the inset shows you that these various cases, Kerr ADS or um, an ideal gas or uh, Reissner Nordstrom, an electromagnetic solution of various things, a born infeld black hole, at, at low um, values of the work you get relative to the total work, you have very different curves. But uh, where we plot here, we plotted efficiency versus the total work you get divided by the maximum work possible. And uh, what we found 
was by looking at all of these, that in fact, there was a theory independent upper limit on the efficiency of any black hole, that no black hole could be more efficient than two pi over pi plus four. Okay. Um, I uh, don't have a lot of time left. I probably have more than I can take. Do you want me to stop here? I could maybe possibly cover one other topic. So you have 20 minutes left. Uh, okay, well, um, I see the audience has shrunk, so I, uh, people have other things to do. Um, let, me, uh, let me skip ADS-CFT except to say, as you can see from this slide, there are two interpretations of what it means to vary lambda in the ADS-CFT context. One is that the, uh, uh, there's a variable field theory volume that has a conjugate gravitational coupling. The other is that you're varying the number of uh, the dimensionality of the N in SUN super Yang mills, and it has a conjugate chemical potential, and both of these have been um, explored. Okay. So I, rather than, and, than doing that, let me get to two other things. Um, is one is accelerator. I, I have, I have a question. Um, yes. What happened with um, tau now metrics? It's possible to analyze uh, this type? Yeah, of there are some papers on that, but I already have too much material in this, so I'm not going to cover that. But yes, there, there are papers that, that I put out and David Kubiznak and, and collaborators put out in the last year, and it does look like you can make, and Clifford Johnson did an early paper. It, it, yes, you can make sense out of this for nut charged black holes, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, I want to talk about accelerating black holes and then complexity and then I'll stop. So accelerating black holes are, have the basic feature that they have both an event horizon and an acceleration horizon. And as I just said, for the cosmological case, they each have their own temperature so you don't have thermodynamic equilibrium. But there is a way around this Namely, if you have an accelerating black hole in anti de Sitter space, there, provided the acceleration is not too large, they will have only, there are exact solutions that will have only one horizon, namely the black hole horizon. And people began to study this a couple of years ago uh, in these papers here. And there were conflicting results for the thermodynamics. For example, the free energy and action were not compatible. So in this paper, in these two papers here, we, uh, we studied this phenomenon. And here's how it works. Um, Hong and Tio, about 17 years ago, found a nice form for the metric of an accelerating black hole. And this metric, here, M is the mass parameter and A is the acceleration parameter. When A is zero, you have Schwarzschild ADS. So this is like a black hole attached to a cosmic string where the string is accelerating it along, the, uh, uh, along itself. It's like it's a giant yo-yo and you're pulling it, except the black hole doesn't spin. Maybe it's like a I don't know, a ball at the end of a chain and you're pulling it. So there is a tension on this cosmic string that is given by this. In fact, you can have a string here and another string there and one will pull it harder than the other, but you can always choose parameters or rather coordinates so that it has only one such string. Um, theta is this angle here and phi is the angle around the string. If you put your thumb along the string and cur curl your fingers, that's phi, whereas theta goes from the North Pole to the South Pole. So in ADS, what happens is this. This cosmic string ends at infinity and ends up distorting the spherical structure that you would normally get in this, in this solid circular line to this dashed 
line intersecting with the circle here. Or put another way, it looks like a teardrop where the cosmic string ends where the teardrop ends. And here is the black hole also a bit distorted. This is Rindler AD. This is, uh, if you set the mass to zero, this space time becomes that one. This is Rindler ADS, and the ADS boundary is beyond infinity in one direction. When the mass is not zero, you have the slowly accelerating black hole, where slow means A times L is less than this number. So it's not an approximation. This is a bound. And you can look in parameter space how M and A are bounded relative to each other. Um, we want no acceleration horizons, which gives us this condition in orange. So obeying the orange condition means this region of parameter space is not allowed. And M has to be, MA has to be smaller than a half. If it's not, then the metric signature is not preserved. But in this clear region, this is where the accelerating black holes live. AL smaller than this thing here and MA smaller than a half. So what prevented people from understanding these earlier was the asymptotic structure. And this is quite subtle because naively you would think as R goes to infinity, I get ADS. But in fact, that's not quite true because the time parameter gets rescaled by this quantity alpha, which is what the square root of one minus A squared over times L squared. Remember, this is less than one. So this square root is, uh, is always of a positive number. So the correct time coordinate asymptotically is not t, it's alpha t. And it was the neglect of that alpha that led to confusion in the thermodynamics. So once we had that, we found the temperature is f prime over four pi alpha. The entropy is still a quarter of the area. The mass, well, this is what got confusing because of the thermodynamic structure, so we ca or, or the asymptotic structure. So we calculated it three ways, using thermodynamic methods via the Smar relation, using conformal methods from the electric part of the vial tensor, and from holographic methods using ADS-CFT counterterms. All three agreed, and we got this answer. So this is the mass of the whole. People had forgotten this alpha, and that is what led it to conflicting results. The action, likewise, made sense. And when you plot the Gibbs free energy versus the mass, you get these Hawking page-like curves. In fact, if the string tension is zero, you have zero acceleration. And this uh, reddish curve is the Hawking page curve we discover that that Hawking and Page discovered in 1983 that I mentioned earlier in the talk. As the string tension goes up, the curve decreases and changes in shape. And we don't know what it means beyond that. We don't know how it can dissolve into radiation because there is a non-zero string tension. So there is still no clear interpretation of what these curves mean when mu is non-zero, the string tension is non-zero. What else? Well, here's a bunch of formula. Uh, the only purpose of this is to show you that you can add both charge and rotation to this and, and the first law and SMAR formula still work. The other phenomenon we found is snapping, as we call it, where at low pressures, uh, we don't have a swallow tail. At high pressures, we, uh, sorry, at high pressures, we get a swallow tail, but as the pressure drops, this branch of the swallow tail disappears and reappears over here. It's why we call it snapping. For P below PT, you're here. For P above PT, there, we're there. And this corresponds to a new branch of unstable black holes at low pressure. 
and the pressure temperature diagrams become more complicated. The coexistence curves develop this new structure here. But I think it's probably enough for now to just say that these accelerating black holes develop a new, bran a new branch of instabilities at low pressure. Uh, my, oh, I want to say a little bit about microstructure. Wei and Liu wanted to ask, OK, what are the degrees of freedom of a black hole from these things? Boltzmann said way, way back that if you can heat something, it has microscopic structure. And what they pointed out or suggested in this paper is perhaps the degrees of freedom are molecular. And what they did is they looked at the coexistence line between large and small black holes and saw that the specific volume had a discontinuous jump in the small black hole case, whereas they, uh, and in the large black hole case. So they thought, hey, the molecular degrees of, the, the degrees of freedom are changing and maybe they are more molecular in character than they are solid. So here's the small hole and the big hole away from criticality, but at criticality, they are the same size. Um, I followed this up in a paper with these two guys last year. And what we found is by looking at the Rupiner thermodynamic curvature, there is a conjecture that positive curvature corresponds to repulsive, positive thermodynamic curvature corresponds to repulsive interactions, whereas negative correspond to attractive. And here we found the first difference between a charged ADS black hole and the van der Waals fluid. So if you remember about an hour and a half ago, I said these were equivalent. Well, actually not quite. If you, there's more to this diagram than I have time to describe, but what I want to emphasize is this coexistence line. Now this coexistence line is between uh, where you become gas and where you become liquid, and above this, they're indistinguishable. White is where the Rupiner curvature is negative. Purple is where it's positive. In a van der Waals fluid, the purple part is here. But in a charged ADS black hole, this curve is distorted to go down here and give this rectangular structure. So what it means is for small charged ADS black holes, we have a phase where the microstructure interactions are attractive, the white part as with the large, but they are also, if the, if the specific volume gets small enough, they become repulsive. So a large black hole always has attractive microstructure, if this conjecture is right, whereas a small black hole has repulsive microstructure everywhere in this region above the coexistence line. Below that, we cannot say, but above that, the conjecture is clear. All right, in the last, how much have I got? Couple of minutes. I'm gonna talk about complexity. This is something we did just this year. Um, there is a new entry in the ADS CFT dictionary. I am also that... working on that. Oh, good. Okay, when? So it will come very soon. Next week, one paper will come. Oh, good. Okay. Well, he, here, let me just say it. I've only got a few slides here, I hope. Um, there is a conjecture relating um, a property of the black hole to the complexity of a quantum circuit in the dual conformal field theory. Complexity refers to the size of the optimal circuit that prepares a given uh, target quantum state from a given reference state using the simplest set of gates possible. In other words, suppose I start from a, a given state, let's say the vacuum, and I want to apply quantum gates to it to get to a target. Well, there are lots of ways of doing it. Complexity refers to the minimum number of gates you need to do that job. Now, this complexity is shown, has been shown to increase even after the boundary theory reaches thermodynamic equilibrium. So the hope is 
that if this relationship between black holes and complexity is right, the complexity will be a diagnostic for black hole interiors, the physics of information scrambling, and so on. And Susskind and collaborators came out with this idea a few years ago. So here is an example of how it would work. You start with a reference, this paper by a call, you apply a bunch of gates to it and you get to a target. The complexity is the difference between the target and the product of all these gates applied to the reference in such a way that this is minimized. And you minimize over n. So you want the smallest value of n that gets you from here to there. Another example given by Vidal is suppose I start with the vacuum, a product of, of a bunch of particles in the vacuum, and I act on it with a bunch of gates to get to the target. Well, the smallest value of n getting me from this vacuum to here would be a measure of the complexity. Well, in terms of holography, there have been two conjectures. One is that complexity is related to volume, namely that the complexity is the maximal volume of a surface connecting the boundary to the interior of the space-time, or in more technical terms, it's the volume of an extremal co-dimension one slice. R is some arbitrary length scale. So the idea is take a boundary slice where the CFT lives, form the maximum surface, uh, or, or form a surface between that, 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 that is, is bounded by that dashed line, find where it's biggest, and that's the complexity. The other is that complexity is the action, that you take a point on the boundary of, of the ADS black hole um, over here and draw null lines in the future and in the past and do the same thing on the other side of the Penrose diagram. When you get that, these null lines will intersect somewhere, generally inside the black hole, and the green area is called the Wheeler-DeWitt patch. And the conjecture is that the action on this entire patch divided by pi is the complexity um, associated with this Cauchy slice of the CFT associated with this Cauchy slice. We, both of these conjectures are still in play. Um, in order for them to make sense, you need to subtract the ADS counterparts from them in each case. But what I want to emphasize from these papers here is the general expectation was that complexity of formation would scale like the entropy of the black hole. This was shown in a number of examples. What we found is this is wrong. We, we claim that entropy actually scales like thermodynamic volume instead of entropy. And the way we demonstrated this was for rotating black holes. So here we have to go to this notion of volume. If you remember for charged black holes, the entropy went like pi r plus squared and the volume like r plus cubed. They are not independent. If you know the entropy, you know the volume. If you know the volume, you know the entropy. And that is true for most spherical black holes. And it's been true so far for all black holes where people have looked at complexity. In other words, entropy and volume are degenerate. But if you have a rotating black hole, as I told you earlier, this degeneracy is broken. The entropy is a function of R plus and A, and the volume is a different function of R plus and A. They are no longer dependent functions. You can't write one in terms of the other without keeping an extra parameter. So this made rotating black holes a good testing ground for this. So the problem is this is an enormously difficult 
technical calculation as demonstrated in this paper in the spherical case. And for rotating black holes, it's even harder. It took us months to do this. Uh, the null hypersurface structure, as Raheem, my student Raheem Belushi and I showed, Al Belushi and I showed, is very complicated for a Kerr black hole. However, if you go to a higher dimensional black hole with multiple rotations and you make them all equal, then you get a big technical simplification. And that's what we did and exploited this property. So here is the metric for a multiply rotating black hole in 2n plus 3 dimensions. It's a bit complicated, but it's nowhere near as complicated as that horrible Kerr ADS thing I showed you about half an hour ago. Um, this space here is a space of constant curvature. In five dimensions, this metric would look like so, um, and A, this parameter here would be a half cos theta d phi. In general, A depends on this, but it's knowing how to do all this. Notice the metric functions are not too painful. The conserved charges and thermodynamic quantities are easily calculated. And notice, to drive the point home, entropy and volume are independent functions. So there are two scaling regimes. If you go to the regime where the black hole is almost non-spinning, when R minus goes to zero, then entropy and volume scale like so. But because they are independent, when you go to the near extremal limit, the entropy scales one way and the volume scales differently. I mean, they scale differently here, but the point is the scaling relations are not proportionately held from static to extremal limits. So we computed complexity equals volume. We computed this extremal volume for this slice, and we found the change in complexity went like the thermodynamic volume to this power. In this paper here, it came out in August, and we have more details in one that came out just this month. Here is the ratio of the complexity of formation from the volume conjecture divided by volume to the three quarters. It's a five dimensional case. So D minus one over uh, D minus two over D minus one is three quarters, right? Right here. It is not proportional to the entropy. And we show this, I mean, you can see it numerically. We take R plus over L to be 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 10 million, 10 million, and the convert curves all converge in the near extremal limit. This would not happen if we divided this by entropy. In fact, here is for all dimensions, well, up to 27, this is what we find if CV scales like beta, and here is what the value of beta would be if it scaled like that. And you can see numerically they are identical. 22.90909, 22.90909, et cetera. We did the same thing for complexity equals action. And here are all the formula. And again, we found this scaling with thermodynamic volume. And again, plotting the, for five dimensions, plotting the complexity uh, action thing divided by the volume to the three quarters, we again see the convert, uh, curves converge as we approach extremality. In fact, they converge pretty good way over here. You don't need to be way over here. To drive this point home, let's actually plot it versus volume and plot it versus entropy. Well, you can see the curves converging for volume and they certainly do not converge for entropy when R plus is 50, 100, or 200. So there is no doubt the scaling relation is different between the two. Does entropy have any meaning? Well, yes. If you believe the reverse isoparametric inequality holds, which it does for this class of black holes, 
then you find the entropy is a lower bound to the complexity of formation. So it doesn't scale like it, but it does have a role to play in terms of bounding it. But the scaling is like the volume. And so there are a number of open questions that I will put out, not only from that, but for this entire study. There is still uh, a lot to do and a lot left to learn from black hole chemistry. And those of you that have hung on to the end, you've been a very patient audience. So thanks a lot. I'm happy to take whatever other questions in the time left. So thank you, Professor Mann, for uh, your detailed talk. And I am very happy that uh, we have learned a lot. And uh, starting from uh, the basic black hole physics to uh, its various applications to uh, wh why the black hole chemistry uh, connection, black hole and chemistry connections can be established through this kind of phase, phase transition uh, phenomena. And uh, I, I hope uh, there are questions from the audience. Please, please people ask, feel free to ask questions. Yes, um, I have a question. Uh, can you answer? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I am uh, David Bill from uh, Florence University. Um, so you mentioned that uh, the extremal limit, uh, you, you mentioned the, that uh, the extremal, uh, you, that you studied the extremal limit of uh, holographic complexity. And, um, but in, um, in this limit, um, I imagine that the, 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 the boundary uh, of the of the geometry uh, rotates uh, faster than the speed of light. It, it is right. Well, as fast, not faster. As fast. In the extremal limit. Oh, oh, sorry. Are you talking? I'm sorry. Are you talking about the multiply rotating black holes? Uh, the the last part. You mentioned. Yeah, that, yeah. That it is possible. Different. There are values of the parameters where these things can rotate faster than light. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And in that case, um, is there actually a CFT state that you are com uh, computing the complexity of or what? That is a good question. Um, this has not been studied. My suspicion is that it will probably not go true or there'll something be, be, be something very strange about the state. But this result I found doesn't require these black holes to be above the speed of light. There are certainly parameter values where, where it's below the speed of light. So what it means is you cross that threshold, I don't know yet. I mean, it, it remains to be explored. Curiously enough, these things have not been studied very much. So I, I mean, you know, it means we still have jobs. <laughs> because this is an unexplored, I, I don't know, at least if somebody's done it, I'm not aware of it. Uh, yeah, um, to be more precise about my question, um, uh, the extremal limit is uh, the limit where the two horizons uh, uh, coincide, right? Yep. And in that limit, we can uh, interpret uh, the, the, the angular uh, velocity relative to infinity as a chemical potential for the putative component. Yeah, in some sense, yeah. Um, in the extremal limit, this uh, uh, chemical potential is always greater than one. Is it correct? Uh, I don't remember. I think so, but I'd have to check. Okay. So, um, you mentioned that uh, the, the important point of the extremal limit is that it distinguishes the behavior of, uh, of complexity. Um, it, it distinguishes the behavior uh, of complexity in the scaling of uh, the scaling with the, with the entropy or with the thermodynamics. So I don't uh, know. That has to be explored. I still think volume. 
um, from based on what we've done, but I'd have to check that to be sure. We haven't looked at the extremal case. So it may be that there is something in the calculation that differs. So I can't answer that. I, I would be, I would cautiously expect it not to differ from what we've got, but emphasis on caution. I, I, I you know, these action and, and uh, especially the action calculation, but also the volume, they're enormously technically complicated. And if you have an extremal black hole, I am not sure all of the steps will follow through the same way. So I, I would not venture anything beyond a tentative yes, that yes. they'll be the same. Okay. But yeah, I, I was not referring to the exact extremal. I mean, I, mean, uh, I take the non-extremal case and take the extremal limit as you did for the... Uh, for the well, if you do that, nothing seems to go wrong. So yeah, whether the extremal limit is the same as the extremal case, I don't know. But in the extremal limit, when R plus goes to R minus, um, if I uh, go to this, um, wherever it is, if I go to these curves here, we don't see any pathologies as we get closer and closer there. But, but this is done numerically. So, you know, I, I mean, it depends on how you believe numeric work, but the volume doesn't have any pathological behavior in the extremal limit. No, but I... And as far as we can tell, neither do our answers, but again... Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, my point was just that uh, the, the, uh, the chemical potential um, is uh, greater than one well before the near extent yeah. limit. Yeah, okay, we don't see, that. sure, we don't see any pathologies there. I mean, as the curves demonstrate, um, okay. uh, am, am I still sharing the screen? Yeah, we, yeah. we don't see any pathologies there. But we have al also, to be fair, we have not studied carefully what happens to everything as one gets to that threshold. So maybe there'll be a surprise there. I don't know. What I can say is that we haven't seen anything yet. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I can't stay on too much longer. Uh, I've got... Uh, something on in actually a quarter to 12. Uh, are there any other questions or... If you have questions, you may write to him. He can give the answers because it is already too long. Uh, yeah. And I, I, have, been, I have one. Not been pushed in a curiosity for Robert. Yep. Yeah, but in the gravity theory, we come to see that black hole has thermodynamics, and as you as you explained the whole evening about thermodynamics. Why does not the other solutions like wormhole solutions uh, and other other solutions of gravity theory has any relation with thermodynamics? Any thoughts about that? Sorry, what other solutions are you talking about? Like wormhole solution. Sorry, I didn't hear. Wormhole. I'm still not getting it. It's not one. Worm just one person talk. Wormhole solution. One War wormhole, baby universes. Oh, wormhole. Yes. Oh, I thought you said one bolt or something. I was saying a uh, nut charge. Uh, wormhole solution. Sorry, the sound didn't come through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, there is not an event horizon, um, but there are, I, I mean, the place where I can say this applies where it's not black holes are for soliton solutions. I did this with Sousen and there's other work by Hedegar and Kanduri recently that, that also look at this. Um, it, it may be that you can sensibly do a thermodynamics with wormholes, um, but, but the question is, do they radiate? These issues are also there for nut charge. And uh, I think we, we, we don't know yet. I'm open-minded to exploring it. What I would say from all of this thing, right, is what I would say is if Hawking was right, then this is right. 
this is a consequence. I, I think it's inescapable that if you're at a certain pressure in the right range, then you are going to see these reentrant transitions for these certain kinds of black holes. And, and so what I would say the main implication of all this work is that whatever the quantum theory of gravity is going to be, it has got to reproduce all of this phenomenon analogous to the way that, you know, in the mid 1800s, whatever is describing chemical behavior, the microstructure better be able to describe liquids and glass and solids and all that stuff. We have the same kinds of things for black holes. So I think this notion that black hole microstructure is going to be one size fits all is very likely naive. Just the way that, I mean, you could say ultimately everything is subatomic particles, but, but whatever the subatomic particle analog is for a black hole, there's got to be more complicated structure in between to get this. Either that, or there better be a darn good reason why all of this stuff doesn't happen, right? It's not incidental. So, so suppose someone finds a quantum theory of gravity and they don't have any of this stuff. Okay, why not? What is going wrong with what is being done here? Because it is all a logical consequence of, yes. of, uh, of what we know about BH thermal. Okay, I have to go, unfortunately. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot for sticking to the end, those of you that did. Good seeing you, sort of, Antonio. Antonia. <laughs> Um, with yours. I enjoyed your lecture and uh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, okay, take care. Okay, feel free to write with me and contact me privately, but unfortunately, I have to go to another meeting. Sure, sure, please. Okay, bye bye. bye, -bye.